Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, one of the issues that we face ongoingly in the classroom is that for most of us, we have students in the class that are all along the spectrum of academic preparation. So we have people who struggle and people who are brilliant, and they're sitting side by side in the same class for most of us. I, think, I thought she was talking about us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've, I've got a representative group. <laughs> and this one she came up with. <laughs> and we've talked about this um, many times and from di many different angles, but I invited these three presenters. Bob has a real uh, personal approach, and so he is able to bring students along through his own personal magnetism. You won't believe that, you know, just by meeting them. But yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, so he has a more he has a more personal approach. Um, Stephen's approach is more through the way the um, the way the major is structured. So you you guarantee success or your work towards student success at different points along the major. So it's it's kind of a more global um, project within the major. And Sarah has worked really productively with students who um, come with academic challenges and they have to pass chemistry. And so we've had testimonial after testimonial of students who've been in their chemistry class and they succeed. And they say one of the, one of the things they do is sit in her office and do their, work their problems with her, guiding them along the way. So there are different ways of providing scaffolding for these students. But I think these three people have been particularly <coughs> successful in uh, bringing about student success without, I think when we talk about this a lot, faculty sometimes think we want them to lower the standard so that everybody can, can pass. But that's really not what we want. We want to figure out a way to get those students where they need to be so that everybody kind of, uh, they won't all be on the same level ever, of course. But we want them, we want them all to get to the level where they can succeed in the class and so they have some strategies for doing that and we're starting with Sarah right sure okay. um, just to kind of maybe helpful as an analogy um, scaffolding is a term that um, we use in education a lot and people keep asking me what is scaffolding what is scaffolding and the best analogy I've heard um, is when you look at a building and they're building something on it and they have a scaffold you know they have a temporary structure that they've set up to help them get to the parts that they need to to work on the building. But when the building is done, that temporary structure comes down. You don't keep it. And so that's kind of what we're doing with students. We're giving them extra things to kind of say, here's how we can get you from where you are now to where we want you to be, but we don't leave that in place for them always. Um, the goal is eventually they can start doing those things themselves and we can remove that extra assistance. Um, so that's kind of, that was a good analogy for me that helped me wrap my mind around what is a scaffold? What does this term actually mean? Um, but one of the courses um, that I teach, I teach chemistry and, and physical science and I have a wide range of students in each. Um, and I, I use Moodle to provide some of my scaffolding things. Um, one of the things I usually do is uh, if I have it, there's a section in each topic that has extra practice um, and the keys to the extra practice. Um, and so if a student is struggling, these are areas I know my students tend to struggle in. So I tell them, print it off, come do it with me. You can do it before or after your homework where points are associated with it. Um, and then you can check your answers. And I usually remind them, reading the key will not help you learn the material. Because um, I think if I pull that up, then I'm good to go. Um, but one of the things that they're struggling with it, I'll ask, have you done this activity? Have you done this worksheet? Um, if not, let's start there and kind of build you up. Um, the other thing I've added recently to try to help some of my students and they're really, the areas they really struggle with, um, it's something that I will say I am not the best person here at. Um, I did come work with the CTE and work with, with Michael to create some videos um, and they're not my favorite but right now they're there to help students because we cover this material in a way that isn't already out there in like Khan Academy, that's way too high a level for them. And so they needed something at that lower level um, if they were struggling in the material. So I have created a couple of videos. Um, Rebecca has some much better videos. Jennifer Cornette has some much better videos. So I'm not even gonna play it for you, but um, if that's something that's of interest. So I try to create some of these resources and 
make them available to students. Um, but then, uh, as Dr. Dirksen said, one of the biggest things is just my office hours. And one of the things that I learned um, from Dr. De Luz was we have a social computing lab where there's no classes ever. Um, it's just for students to work. And I filled some of my office hours in there because they do online homework. Um, I try to get the ones directly after class. And so after class, I, if I have a break for office hours to be scheduled there, which I don't for every class, but some of them I do, I just say, I'm going up to the computer lab. Anyone wants to come with me and do these problems? Come along, you can try them. If you get stuck, I'll ask you questions until you get the right answer. Um, I'm not gonna give them the answer. I'm not gonna do the work for them, but I will guide them and they can get it to where they can get the right answer. And so for some of them, they do. They live in my office or they live in the computer lab with me uh, while they work through the problems and get their questions answered as they're going through. And so that's something that I found just moving it sometimes even out of my office into a common space, they felt more comfortable doing that homework and getting that help right away. Now not all of them are there, a lot of them are still in my office. Um, and I tend to have a pretty good sized group that hangs out in my office on a regular basis. But I really try to, those who are not doing well come first exam, you need to come to my office and work on your homework and ask questions and stuff as you go um, to try to encourage them to do that and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, so those are some of the things, trying to make different things available that they can do on their own time, whenever they want, whenever they're working on it. Um, and then making myself kind of trying to encourage them to take advantage of those opportunities in my office and when I'm available. Um, and I, I do tell them I was a student here at Lee uh, and I lived in my professor's offices. I was not one who got the material easy. I needed the help. And so I tell them that was me now it can be you, and I understand exactly what it's like because I was there. Um, and so that's something that I, I'd like to be able to get back to them. There are other things, but I'll... Going down the road. <clears throat> Just because you're older than me, we'll, well, let, that, we'll yeah. let that go. Yeah. This may look like it's lots of notes. It's, it isn't. It's just random stream of consciousness stuff because I had, I had no idea that I did scaffolding because I didn't know what it was. Um, and so when Carolyn told me that I was good at it. so much from me. Uh, yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, when she told me I was good at it, I needed, I needed to look it up to find out what it was that I was good at. Um, and so it was just, I haven't thought about this um, in any sort of systematic way. So for me, the thought process is just putting words on a page and seeing what comes out. And so this is not going to be particularly organized probably. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, listen, there's no replacement for time spent one-on-one -on -one with students in your office and outside of class. There just isn't. Um, and at Lee, if you haven't been here very long, you're going to recognize that really quickly, that there is no way to be able to provide the support networks without time spent. Um, I'm going to ignore that fact and say, can we reduce the amount of time spent outside of class by being more thoughtful about macro structures? Um, so, for example, uh, a, a junior is going to be able to handle an assignment better than a freshman. Theoretically, that junior will take less time than the freshman. If they're both in the same class, that doesn't make any sense, right? So, so if you think about the pro if you think about a course of study as starting at a particular place and wanting to get students to another place, there's a there's a path there that we should be more systematic about. Um, structuring for them and and so the sort of the modern student choice just you know get 16 classes and check them off and do them in whatever order that you want that 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 works counter to this sort of scaffolding approach i would argue in a, in a macro sense and so our major more than most on campus is is very structured um we advise remarkably aggressively um in terms of I know it's not a real prerequisite, but it actually is. Or it's not an official prerequisite, but it actually is. Are you sure you want to do this? This is where we're going. Um, and so I think we spend a lot of time on curricular development, course development, path development, advising. And that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about. And the things that I think over time, um, I've taken more seriously um, as, as we've thought about this. Um, 
obviously 100, 200, 300, and 400 level courses should be different. <laughs> that's why they're numbered that way. And, uh, and so that's the first easy thing to remember is that a kid in a 100 level course can't be expected to consume the same information, do the same assignments as a kid in a 400 level course. That's simple, obvious. It turns out that lots of courses aren't thoughtfully numbered. If you, some of these courses have been around for 20 years, it turns out, and we, about 10 years ago, we, we canceled every number and we recreated the major um, with the help of Susie Deaton. Um, we actually changed the prefix because POLS was in the system for 30 years and we couldn't use the numbers of POLS, so we created PLSC and then we could do whatever we wanted. And that proved to be really helpful for us to just literally from the ground up rebuild the sequence um, and be really, really thoughtful about that. But even within levels of courses, there are tacit orders to things. Right? So in comparative politics, we have an intro to comparative politics class, and then we have a European politics class. They're both 300s. But I can't teach European politics without intro to comparative politics. If I, I, I can, and we do because we don't like to prerequisite things here because it's too rigid. But, but I can advise that very, very clearly. And I can build a different set of assignments in my European politics class based on the fact that I know every kid in there has taken comparative or enter the comparative, right? And so we have, we're, we're a small department or a small discipline, and that helps. There's only three of us that have to coordinate this, but we work very, very hard to what level should you be teaching this course at? And therefore, what level of reading can we expect? I don't mean in terms of amount of pages. I mean in terms of textbook versus primary sources versus quantitative versus qualitative. Um, what types of writing can we expect? Are we just looking for thesis development? Are we looking for data analysis? Are we looking for synthetic writing? Are we looking for descriptive writing? And, and again, the, the idea is that juniors and seniors are better at synthetic quantitative stuff than freshmen and sophomores. And until we teach the freshmen and sophomores how to write a sentence and a thesis statement, we can't expect them to do more than that. Yeah. And so I think that kind of curricular intentionality will will lower, hopefully, the amount of time outside of class that you need. Um, and, and again, I think, again, it, it runs counter to consumer models, but I do think that it's important uh, to think through your disciplines, and our, and our disciplines are different, and perhaps some of them are less ordered than others, but, but asking yourself that question consistently, I think, will really help um, do that. And, and so that's sort of point, point number one. Um, beyond the order of courses and the sequence of courses, I think you should think about sequencing assignments. And I don't mean within a course, I mean across a course, across courses. So we have a senior thesis for every senior who graduates, they're required to do a semester long original research paper. Uh, and it's a, it's a burden. <laughs> Uh, it's a big project um, for them. It, it's great for writing samples for graduate school. It's, it's great for a whole bunch of things. But the point is, if we haven't built all sorts of little writing assignments for the three years prior to senior thesis, they are, they're just not going to be able to do it. Um, and, and the amount of work that it takes to mentor a student one-on-one -on -one who doesn't have that training versus the kid who does have that training is ten times, tenfold. Uh, it turns out. And so, again, we try, or I try particularly, to, to start small and do pieces along the way, if that makes any sense. I think a lot of us do big projects within a semester in pieces, right? So if you have a semester-long project, you say, okay, do a, write a question, do an annotated bibliography, do a literature review, you know, whatever. But I'm not talking about that, although that's important, too. I'm talking about I know what you have to do as a senior to get you to where you need to be. What do I need to have you do as a sophomore? And so in the 200 level courses, these are the types of writing assignments I want you to be able to handle. In 300 level courses, I want you to be able to handle something more significant. Um, and then by 400 level senior thesis, we're, maybe, we're, maybe we're closer, if that makes any sense. Um, and so again, these are the sorts of macro things that I think are, are um, really important. 
again, these are random thoughts, and I don't know if they're particularly well organized. I think that we often confuse amount of work with difficulty. And I would challenge you to begin to think significantly about accomplishing the same task with less. Less pages of reading, less pages of writing, just less work. Um, when I first started, I, I think this is a bigger problem for junior faculty because I think you, you've just been minted a genius, right? They gave you a PhD and, and you think you need to communicate everything you know because you can't remember what you didn't know when you were a freshman. You think, like, the only way to understand presidentialism is to do every subtle dimension of that question that you can possibly imagine because that's what you were just tested on and that's what you just wrote your dissertation on. When in fact, all you really need is a definition and a contrast to parliamentary systems, right? And that's what you learned when you were a freshman or when you were a sophomore. And I think, I think junior, when I first started teaching, I had eight pages of lectures per hour, pages of lecture notes per hour. And I covered it. <laughs> I average about a page and a half now. And part of that is just I've taught it 22 times or 44 times or whatever. But a lot of it is I just don't cover the same stuff, right? I, I cover way less than I used to. Um, and again, there are obviously some disciplines and some materials that are descriptively, substantively necessary to cover. I'm not talking about those classes uh, or that material, but there's other material that is conceptual or theoretical or analytic that you can accomplish the same thing. I think you can accomplish the same thing with less. And so 10 pages of serious academic reading can be way more effective than 50, depending on what you want the students to produce. Do you want the students to just get the general idea? Do you want the students to do something analytic with it? Do you want students to do something? So number of pages is irrelevant, largely. It's what you want out of the student. And I think, I think we focus too much on, on, I need to give them more, because otherwise they're not working. And I hate what I'm going to say next because it bothers me. But we teach a different generation of students than we were. And these kids have jobs and full-time lives that they, I was a full-time student. I went to school from eight to six every day and didn't have a job. And, and I could read 200 pages a week per class. That was ridiculous, by the way, too. But, but, our, but our kids are in a different place than that. And, and education is situated in a different place than that. And I'm not talking about getting easier. No one of our students thinks that the ply sci major is easy, um, because it's not. But I think, I think we can be challenging with less. And that would be sort of, was that third or fourth random thought? I don't know. I don't know how many random thoughts that is. Um, have I talked long enough, Bob? I have another random thought for you, Steve. Yeah. They, in their introduc introductory class, when they give their first exam, if the student fills that first exam, then they have to have a tutor. They do. And they have the upper division students tutor those students. Yeah. And so they work with them. So right away they identify this is a kid at risk in this major. They don't know the basic terminology or they don't know how to read or whatever. And so then they work with an upper division student to try to get past that. So they know early. I guess I should let you tell the story instead of me telling you're probably better at telling it. Um, the, uh, yeah, and it, again, I would lump that into the things you do outside of class, the, the, the first category of things, for sure, and we, we do a lot of that. Um, but again, I'll, Carolyn should get more credit for this than me, but the reason that we give uh, service hours for tutoring now is because of this program. Um, because when we started it several years ago, you, Leonard Center wouldn't give you service hours for tutoring because it was on campus and it was with your peers and so on and so forth. And so we, we put this program together and we ran it sort of internally without resources. And we just, this is back to aggressive advising. We just told our juniors and seniors, you don't have a choice. You're a poli sci major, you're going to tutor somebody. Like this isn't optional. Uh, and again, for those of you that know me, that's probably not surprising to you that that's how I tend to operate. But, but for two years, that's what we had to do. And, and, and we just collected data and said, listen, prior to this program, 85% of the kids who failed the first test f failed to finish the course. When we instituted the program, the numbers reversed. 85% of the kids who were part of the tutoring program passed the class. 
Um, and we just took that data to the Leonard Center and we spent a long time uh, sort of arguing for it. And, and by the way, it doesn't just help the it doesn't just help the freshmen and the sophomores that are struggling. It also is a great opportunity for our older kids. Uh, it creates a culture uh, in our department. And again, a lot, of the, a lot of the people in that course are not majors. And so this literally will be their only exposure to poli-sci. So it's, it's not just identifying majors that are struggling and helping them along. It's, it's, it's helping the general education people as well. It's a, it's a labor-intensive thing. Um, and uh, and we've... we've We've, there have been semesters where we've exhausted our resources significantly and we've had to move to one-on-two tutoring or one-on-three tutoring, which we don't love, but it's still better than, we won't let them take the second test. They will not be allowed to take the second test unless they have at least five hours of tutoring between exam one and exam two. And that's a hard conversation with a kid who walks in and says they want to take the second test and you, and you say no you've only done two hours or you haven't signed up with a tutor yet or whatever. Um, but that's, that's, the, that's the, the thing that she's talking about. And I, there are other majors, I think, that have adopted similar things now. Um, and, and that's, I guess, that's the story, at least. And our department does more of the group tutoring. Yeah. So I like the idea of the one-on-one. -on -one. But we have, I mean, we have students who, uh, we have a practicum course where it's one credit hour and they, you know, they TA and they help tutor. And so they're paying for the privilege to come in at night and tutor. Um, you know, it's, it's not just they're not, you know, once they do that, they can do the service hours and stuff, but they actually, they're willing to because they get so much out of it as well, reviewing for the MCAT and getting this experience and stuff. So they're willing to, hey, I'll pay for a course to be able to do this. We, we have a three-hour research and teaching practicum as well where, mm -hmm. where they, they, for an entire semester, they, 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 they don't co-teach, but they parallel teach an intro class with us. And so we may have one person who, who is lecturing periodically, doing review sessions periodically for a group, and we do the same thing. Um, we try to reserve it for people who are going to get into the teaching profession or graduate programs or something like that, but we, we do something very similar. And by the way, we, we also use the money from the, from the tutoring center, which you can get paid for tutoring, it turns out, but Luan eventually said, you're using up all my money, you need to stop it, because we were, we were literally this program was sapping all of her resources to pay tutors for other courses. And so we had to figure out a solution in the, the service hour thing. So some of our kids are getting paid, some of them are getting service hours, some of them are getting course credit. Um, some of them are just doing it because I feel like I can suggest to them it's a good idea. Um, so anyway, it's your turn, Bob. Thank you, Bob. has a big high-tech system. Yeah, uses. completely high-tech. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I'm a little hesitant to, to start the way I'm going to start. Uh, and Ashley, you may remember that I kind of brought this up in, in a teacher education committee meeting and we had a, an individual that was pretty critical of what I said. But I do think there's been a change in education. I think there's been a change of it in education in terms of how you do things. I find that it's interesting that now the way we define literacy is twittering and texting and everything else. And I just don't see that as the same thing. I, I, I think that the system is different than it used to be. I feel a complete admiration for people who teach in public schools because I think they really are, are working in a, in a tough environment. And, you know, when you see the things that uh, you see, for example, the Hamilton County stuff last week about teacher effectiveness, you know, it just seems to me to be more kind of ammunition for those people who say, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach. And oftentimes I have students who are interested in teaching, see this little three minute Taylor Malley video. If you haven't seen that, what, what teachers make, you ought to see it, it's profound, it's great. But the problem is, is that I think we live in an increasingly anti-intellectual environment. And by that, I mean that I think the basic skills are missing. You know, I, I grew up at a time when being able to spell wasn't if you can find the spell check button. <laughs> it was being able to spell a word. And, you know, um, 
as a consequence, I've had to kind of change how I approach certain things. Um, for example, I used to have really long research papers. But the reality was that I found myself spending a, an inordinate amount of time. As a matter of fact, I go through each one of these papers three times with three different inks, you know, addressing grammatical errors and fragments and run-on sentences. And I, and I finally decided I, I can't just look at one, the first page and the third page and then kind of read for content. So I have now shortened those papers so I can actually assess those kinds of skills. I wish I didn't have to do that. I still think I do a pretty good job actually looking at content. But, you know, I've now taught long enough that I can say that wasn't always the case. Um, I ask um, students in my recent American history class, which is a you know core class uh, last year, so how many of you guys have written uh, an essay exam? And the huge, the huge majority of them had never done it. Now, for me, this, this poses another risk. And to be really honest with you, you know, the risk is, is, it, is, is that you don't realize that things are changing. I actually don't think it's the student's fault. I just think they're not expected to do the same things as they used to be able to do. And, and I understand things change, and I get the PowerPoint and everything, but I've got to say, I still believe that if technology was the answer, we would be living in the most brilliant society ever created, and I don't see that. I mean, all you got to do is turn on politics now. Careful. Well, I'm not going to say anything, but I just turn on every side. <laughs> You know, and or, or or watch a football game and they misspell. I mean, last year I saw there was a, a game on and they had Air Force on, on the score through the entire game for Air Force and they misspelled force. The guys are hating me at Burger King because they can't spell worth a flip at Burger King. And when they put something on the on, on the on the sign outside, you know, whopper. I mean, how hard is that? It's their deal. Do you think they can spell it? <laughs> you know, you, 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 there's another P there. <laughs> so I think that we we're, we're in a in a, in a at a time when we don't seem to have the same kinds of emphasis on fundamental skills, or at least something is happening. Now. Carolyn, you don't remember this, I bet you. I'm much younger than you. Yeah. Well, everybody is now. But, <laughs> but the reality is the first conversation I ever had with you, you went to some real length telling me something that I never forgot. And that was, you're going to have every kind of student in your classroom. Now, the very first conversation I ever had with a Lee student was a, a conversation with, with a guy named John Miller. And John said, as we're walking out of classroom. He said, so are you going to dumb things down? I said, why would I do that? Well, you're late. And you know what I found out was that I didn't need to dumb things down. We have some really brilliant students here. I mean, really brilliant students. But we also have those students who have struggled with some. I don't think it's always their fault. I don't. You know, I, I, you know, I can't tell you how many students I, I, I have in my, my office and we talk about, you know, so I, I've never gotten a D in my life. How is that possible? Well, have you ever, well, I never, I never actually had to study. That's not their fault. So, you know, I, I, I think that part of what I've come to realize is that you got to know your audience. It's not always their fault. We live in a world where an educated person is defined by the fact that they passed a test. They may have forgotten all that information since, but that's what it is to be educated today. That, that troubles me a great deal. And one of the things I, I will certainly echo that, that both Sarah and Steve have, have mentioned is that you gotta be present and available. You, I mean, this is, this is a laying on of hands ministry. It's one of the reasons, without causing a, a big discussion about this, one of, the, one of the reasons I love the paradigm of how we do things at League traditionally. Have you noticed the new Brian commercials? We educate in the classroom. And I'm thinking, 
we did that better than they did. Where are we? Where are our ads? You know, because I think people are beginning to realize that that's really how you educate people. It's a laying on of hands. It's a personal relationship. I'm going to tell you what. You get the, <laughs> you, Sarah, you get those people in your office. It's not just about you teaching them how to do this. It's about the fact that you care enough to be there with them. And see, when you have those conversations about you can't take the second test, you know, that's pretty powerful. And, 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 you know, I, I actually, I, I've, got to, I've got to tell you, I, I've learned a couple of things, only a couple. And that's better than I usually do, because normally I tell you I don't know anything. But I have learned, <laughs> this has been a, a kind of a year of revelation. Some of it I'm kind of disappointed in. But, but one thing I've learned has been that you're never really good at this. I always knew that. You're, this is one of those professions you never are going to be good enough. Every time you think you got it down, then you get a whole another group and none of this stuff works, you know, that worked last semester. And that can be frustrating, but it's also kind of exhilarating. Secondly, I've learned that what we tend to pat ourselves on the back for, and people may disagree with this, but you know, we've had students here who are absolutely brilliant, and I didn't teach them a thing. Your daughter, oh my God. I just want to keep her from being bruised and help her get where she needs to be. You know, I got, I got to tell you the truth, and I'm not saying that, but I got to tell you the truth, Mark. I'm not going to teach her much because she already knows a lot of this stuff, and she knows how to do it. But you know, the real trick of this is teaching the kids that don't know that stuff. That you, I mean, I think that's wonderful. Now, I'm not saying these are unimportant people, and I'm not saying you don't contribute something that's dramatic and important in their lives. But you know, I've, I've kind of learned that I think when I think about teaching, that's what I think about. That's one of the reasons I love teaching the, the recent American history class, because I have so many people who hate it. At least that's how they start. They hate it. And I ask them, because I tell them, I hated it too. I mean, I didn't, I became a history major my junior year. The way I, I you know, I, I can understand, I mean, I never had a plan. You know, I mean, I had seven different majors my first two years. Not because I was this renaissance guy, but, but because I was trying to stay away from math and history. You know? And I had this guy who actually wouldn't let me drop a class. And I'll tell you this story, and some of you have heard it, but, but I think it's worth repeating. I, you know, I, I was a terrible student. I mean, I've got a two-year transcript like this, and that's not because I did so well. And I, I, I lived in this big house with these guys, you know, to, to really further date me. It was kind of this Grateful Dead experience house in a lot of ways. That was the old name. And one of the guys that lived with us, none of us liked but we had him there because he was responsible and we knew the rent would get paid. The rest of us you couldn't depend on, but you know. So one day he comes in and, and, and I've got to register for my junior year fall class. And he says, you know, we ought to take this class together. I said, what is it? He says, it's this, this professor is supposed to be fantastic. Well, what's the class? Oh my gosh, and I know you don't like to get up early so it doesn't start till 10. Yeah, but what's the class? You know, it's kind of like what she looked like, great personality. Well, you, know, that, you know, let's just be, I know that's politically incorrect, but let's just face it. And he says, well, okay, it's a history class. And I said, I don't do history. He said, oh, come on. You can drop it. You I mean, heaven knows you've dropped all kinds of other classes. <laughs> so I go to this class, and this guy is really good. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, I mean, he's really good. I mean, he knew his stuff, and he took what I thought was history, and he kind of ripped that apart, and he said, you know, everything is history. There's not, a, there's not a subject offered on this campus that some historian is not considering. There's no other discipline you can say that about. And I thought, wow. And he said, but I'm, but, and I'm really sorry, though, that we're not going to be able to talk about the research paper today, but we will talk about it next time, and I thought, you might but I'm not going to be there. Because another one of my goals was, why do you need to go to a library? So I immediately went over 
to drop the class. I went to the registrar's building, came back. Ten minutes later, I'm knocking on his door. And I'm telling you, a series of miracles happened that I thought were amazing. And frankly, just to be really transparent, when I'm really suffering spiritually and I'm thinking, okay, I don't understand all this stuff. I'm not even sure about it. There are certain parts of this that I, I cannot talk about without considering God had a plan. So I said to him, you know, I was just in your class and, I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I got to drop it. And he said, how come? And I said, well, I'm just focusing on the courses in my major. Thank goodness he didn't say, what is your major? Because I was so confused, I didn't know. And you know, this idea that, you know, secular schools, these guys don't really care about students. Let me tell you what this guy cared. He still is my example. And he didn't just sign the drops up and say, one last student. So then, in, I know you're going to find this impossible, but in the, the, the 15 seconds of kind of dead air, which made me really uncomfortable, I blurted out, and I really don't like history anyway. And he said, how come? And I said, because it's just about a bunch of dead guys. And I remember his eyes kind of rolling back in his head, but he still didn't sign that drop slip. And ultimately what he did was something extraordinary. He said, I tell you what, if you will stay in this class, and your daughter's heard this story. She said, I mean, he said, I guarantee you, if you'll engage and do what you're supposed to do, I'll give you four days this semester you really like. You know, and again, math is not my strong suit, but even I knew four days in an entire semester is not a very high percentage of time. But the very fact that he was going to make this important to me I thought was extraordinary, and he, and he changed my life. I've, I've been able to get him here twice, and it's, it's fantastic what he's, what he's accomplished in his lifetime. But I think my point in all of this is, I was one of those guys that was changed by someone who, if you, if you would have looked at me and looked at my transcript, you would have, many people probably would have thought, why do I want to mess with this guy? I love having a chance to deal with those people. And, and I think that's another part of what we do. I don't know if that's actually scaffolding, but then again, I, until not that long ago, I mean, I'm thinking it's what you put on the outside of the building, the paint. But, but, but you know, I do that. So is this a faculty council initiative to not let people drop courses after the first yes. week of class? Well, maybe so. But, but I, I, but we, can do it to week we can do it to week 17. Can we have a 15-week semester? But I'm going to tell you one other thing real quickly, and this is how. Quickly, Bob? Because, so, yeah, no, it's going to be amazing. Right. But I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I get these little kind of things, and they, they come slowly to me. But every summer I teach uh, Western Civ 1, which is actually not always my favorite class until the last few years. Because I think education is really important now. More important maybe than ever before. I mean, I think, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, the world is at a point. You know, it's pretty, pretty serious. So I always try to find these little things. And one of the things I found I wanted to pursue was the notion of citizenship. You know, it's a classical idea, citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen? And then I, 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 I I thought we'd talk about Socrates and the examined life, which, which focuses on <clears throat> moral philosophy and the past. So one day I told my students, okay, so you got homework. And what I want you to do is I want you to think. Now, I was completely serious about that. So the next morning we gathered, I said, so let's talk about homework. About three of them said, we thought you were kidding. I said, no gave you homework. What did you think about it? And what followed was about a 20-minute conversation that was extraordinary. Because some of these people said, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know how to do that. Or I was too busy. And you know, that's another issue. When we've got people who are expecting to do the kind of things that it takes to be educated that actually don't really know how to think, one of the girls said, I didn't know what to think about. 
I didn't know what to contemplate. Somebody else said, well, you know, I, I spend all my I, I work and I have two other classes. And then I, you know, and I said, well, what'd you do during the night? She said, well, you know, I went home and did Facebook and all that stuff. Kind of cluttered life. Not an examined one, but a cluttered one. So what I'm trying to do is, one, to connect with these people. Two, to encourage them. Because I've seen people who've done remarkable things, not all of them. But, you know, I mean, had it not been for this one guy, I would have been one of those people that I don't know what I would have been doing. Maybe working at, you know, a home, you know, store of some kind. But I've also had to kind of consider the fact that we've got a different group of people. And, and I'm really, you know, what bothers me about the conversation we had about some of you who were in the liberal arts thing, you know, about, about the, the disappearance of the liberal arts, is to me, that's a disappearance of, of, of what is supposed to teach what life should be about, what you're supposed to contemplate, what you're supposed to think about, what it is to be a citizen. You know, in all due respect to those of you guys who do science, technology, and math, and there's a place for that, if that's all we got, this is gonna be a pretty hollow world. So I'm taking this pretty seriously, and I'm doing everything I can to get them there, and, and, I, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, all I can tell you is, however you scaffold, however you care, however you do it, and, you know, most of you guys I've known for so long, and uh, those of you I don't know, I know most of you have been doing this for a while, so I kind of feel a little bit of a sham to even talk about this, but I just want to encourage you. This is really important now. So. Can I follow up on one thing? Sure. I'm going to disagree with Bob on I would like to teach Mark's daughter, not that she's ever going to take a class from me, but my approach is not to focus on the struggling students in the same way. And and one, this, that that's not the real point. The real point is you can comment differently on the same assignments based on the student's progress. So if I have a kid who the assignment in its basic form won't challenge I'll expect them to do more than the assignment. And I will comment about depth in ways that I can't comment about depth on the kid who really just needs to know how to write a sentence right now. And, and so if I, if, I, if I graded those the same, either the top will never grow or the bottom will be crushed into a pile of goop. Um, and so I, I know my students well enough to grade them differently and the best kid is not going to get away with the same paper as the kid who's who hasn't started and and it's okay to collapse that grade if that makes any sense you, you, you the standard doesn't have to be the a kid and then the other kid gets an f like you can that that's bob's encouraging thing like you a recognition of the sub subjectivity of a student I think is really useful when it comes to the breadth of people that we have in our classrooms and and so again if I've got a kid who's struggling I'm gonna focus on macro learning and then if I've got a kid who's breezing I'm gonna drill in on that kid and make make that kid work really hard they're gonna get as much red ink from me as the other kid it's just going to be a different type of red ink. And if I communicated that I don't care about Mallory, that's not what I meant. No, I, and I, but, I, I, I agree. But, but, I, but I do, but I do but, think that's one of the challenges. You know, it is. I mean, it I, is. I mean, you know, let's just face it. You know, I've got colleagues who I know elsewhere, and we all do. You know, who teach a two-two load, and you know, their their total uh, enrollment in both of those classes will be less than. Uh, you know, we have in our smallest class of the four or the five that we teach. You know, I think we do a remarkable thing here. I, 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 I'm not suggesting Lee is perfect, and I, those of you who know me pretty well, I, I, I can be pretty critical and complaining. But you know what? I think we do pretty well. But I think we also are faced with some real unique kinds of challenges. Again, getting back to that first conversation. I didn't know what it was. And, and you know, to, to have these people. I mean, I have had, you know, I had a group that included people like Jared Wilford and Coral Norwood 
and Hannah, some people that you guys don't know, but a lot of these people have gone on and they're teaching at other universities. They've done really well. And frankly, they got into grad programs that I would have never been accepted at. I mean, they are as, they are as good as you could have found any place. And, and I don't want to give the impression that those people don't count. As a matter of fact, you know, I think they are also part of the definition of what Lee is about to do. I'm just saying, when you have all those people in one class, you do have to figure this out. And I think that's, 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 that's kind of a, a unique challenge. How many have you had in your G12 sessions? And you teach three sections of it, right? Well, I'll have 85, you know, about 100 in each. Three sections? Yeah. And then I've got two other upper level history classes, which are, which are fun too. So. But one of those sections, a lot of them are dual enrollment kids because we're trying to kind of reach out to them. You see both ends of the spectrum there too? Yeah. Yeah. I had a comment, uh, and then a, question, a real question later on. Uh, my comment is, as far as students being uh, culture disciplined because of their work, how they work, I think that's been the case for a lot of students for a long time. Right? I remember the uh, most famous case being Bobville in the city of Lowell, the University of Minnesota. They said I was so busy with writing songs and playing in bars. He said I never went never went to a college class that he wasn't on. But uh, my question is, is, there, is I, I grade a lot of essays, of course, but I had trouble with how I'm communicating that these days. I used to just write it out longhand, and students can't read it at times. <laughs> <laughs> so then I tried Dragon Speak software. Oh, how many of you have used Dragon Speak? Mm -hmm. The learning curve is so steep. Mm -hmm because it has to learn the words. I didn't have time to grade 30 essays every two days and and put in an input to the dragon speak, so I gave up on that. Now I'm writing shorthand and I type it up and I put it in there, but I'm not sure that they're reading it or that I'm helping them by putting it in there. So what do you look for? Yeah, I mean, we, we write a lot as well, and, and it's something we're not gonna get rid of. Um, and I, I will tell you that Tom Pope and I have very different approaches to this. Tom, Tom Pope just spends time, like you do, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll write comments as extensively as he always has. Um, I've, this is my 23rd year of teaching or something. I, I write minimal comments. The comments are for me, um, to remind me what I was thinking when I was reading it, and, and I, I do two things. I tell students to come talk to me about it and we'll work through it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, or for the students who really want the sophisticated comments, I tell them I'll read it again after I pass it back. And so out of a course of 30 people, I may get three that want me to do the old-fashioned work through it thing. And that's just a survival technique for me. That's, that's just, I don't have the time to, uh, to make them write as much as I want them to have a, a wife and a family and a life and and spend an hour and a half on a eight page paper um, so i've I've gone to really really shorthanded commentary for me so that I remember what's going on and then I encourage them to interact with me if they want it and again different students, some students will flip to the last page, they'll see the grade, they'll put it away, they'll never look at it again. Right. Other, kids, other kids want the systematic feedback, and, and of course we have to encourage more kids to want the systematic feedback. Uh, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't sort of be crossing your fingers and hoping that none of them want you to reread it. But that's, that's how I've been able to keep the number of, the amount of writing higher, I think, um, is, by, is by going to a very, very quick commentary on the on the on the papers and I have a go ahead I have a I have a friend who uh, is at BYU um, a very good friend of mine from grad school who who has over the course of 10 years created a template of comments and he has them numbered 1 to 40 and he just writes numbers in the margins and then passes back the rubric to his students it's a brilliant idea that I don't have the time to create, but, but 
that's remarkable. So you, a one is a paragraph of commentary because you run across the same issues over and over and over and over and over again. And, and it, it has saved him a remarkable amount of time. But again, there's a, there's a startup cost because initially it had 12 numbers on it and now it has 35 numbers on it because the, the number of comments have changed. But, but I think that's worth exploring if that sounds like something that might. And so literally, it, they just 17126. And it does grammar, content, it does everything. We have a rubric and uh, check it off, but I always add personal comment. And uh, the students ask, ask me to read the comments. I didn't tell I started to type. But I found out once they, they deal with it in the class, but they, I never had a student, well, never, I've had a very rarely do I have a student email me and say, can you give me some more information? I want to, I encourage them in class verbally to do that. Yeah. But almost none of them do. Uh, at another institution, I use uh, some software called Turnitin. Mm -hmm. And I think it was originally devised to catch plagiarism. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. However, the best part of it, in my mind, was the drag and drop comments. And it's not speak. It's just drag, drag and drop, drop, drag and drop, drag and drop. I never drag. Knew that. that was the best part of turn it in. And um, our learning management system was not Moodle. It was um, Desire to Learn, E2L. And it was actually, they embedded the turn it in within the learning management system. So the students put their papers in the Dropbox, and we opened it, and I'm not a tech person, but we opened it in Turnitin through the learning management system. And I mean, somebody just set that up for us. All we had to do was click on the Turnitin, and it opened their paper in that software, and we could read through it, drag those comments over, put the grade on it, and so then when they wanted to see the feedback, they had to go and to turn it in and see the feedback. But all they had to do was mouse over, it's those little bubbles like you see in comic strips, yeah. just all over their paper, and they could just mouse over each one of those bubbles and see that it said run on sentence, this is a great point, and they had standard comments within the list, but also ones that I could add in, you know, my 45 to the ones that I use all the time and add to it. And uh, it was great. Awesome. I'm sorry to say that our time is up and you're going to have to trudge out into the rain now. Um, but I have a couple of umbrellas if you want to borrow them. <laughs> if you want to go out in a hurry. But thanks to the presenters. It was really helpful.